Diane. Diane. Uh, Nathan. Nice to see you again. Jared. Jared. Micah. Based or are they so they they are actually um, the research and extension arms of the College of Food Ag and Environmental Science. So we 
the Cal Centers is a combined research and extension location. So we don't have credit, course credit, uh, but we have, uh, for example, extension programming, cool. field trials, that kind of thing. Good question. So this is my obligatory disclaimer. Um, some of you might have seen, um, I have a degree, I have a law degree, I have a background in law. Um, this presentation is for educational purposes only. It's not legal advice and it's not substitute for competent legal advice. Just take note of that. <laughs> okay, so let's think about cooperative and collaborative opportunities, right? These are really opportunities where as, as uh, farmers, you're gonna go out and create your own business, right? So each of you are going to have your own farm business, which is really what we're gonna be talking about next week. So we're kind of, we're starting with the collaborative and then next week we'll be talking about the individual business planning, right? So we can think about there'll be 18 up to 20, how many, 25 different farms, hopefully at the end of this project, right? Um, coming out of this training program. What are the opportunities where multiple farmers can come together to reduce barriers that they might have to market product? Specifically thinking about marketing again this evening. So the question really is this, can you do something better as a group than you can individually? So when you're thinking about marketing food products, what might be some of the barriers to that? So if you, let's say, you go out and your farm is producing like crazy and you have carrots and radishes and herbs and tomatoes and cucumbers, what are some of the barriers to getting those products into the hands of the final eater? person who's going to consume them. Yeah. Um, it's very time sensitive. So if you don't have buyers lined up, you could lose food. Yes, it's very time sensitive, right? We're talking about perishable products that are in part sold based on their quality and their quality declines at, over time. And sometimes very quickly, right? So it's not a linear process. What else? Competitors. Competitors potentially, right? So is there saturation in the marketplace, right? What's being produced and is it um, of similar quality, of similar type? What's the price point? Is there an advantage there? What else? Health regulations. Sure. Uh, we could probably just pull that back and say food safety regulations, right? And, and food safety uh, management, risk management, right? For food safety, what else? Time. It time. takes time to grow, the, do the growing, and it takes time to make those connections with the buyers. Absolutely. What else? <clears throat> Let's think a little more like practical, logistical. So to get a crop from your farm into the hands of a buyer, what do you need? Distribution, Distribution networks, yeah. right? You're gonna probably need bins and boxes and maybe trucks and cooler space, right? Because of this perishability thing. Okay, and then what? Did I hear somebody say customers? Finding them? Yeah, you have to find the people, right? You have to get the people to the place where they will buy your thing, right? So all of those are parts of marketing. And these opportunities that I'm gonna talk about are, are potential avenues where farmers have um, maybe recognized those barriers and been able to address some of those barriers potentially by um, some format where multiple farmers come together, okay? So again, we're thinking about marketing these food and farm products. So let's think about farmer's markets. There's a farmer's market here in Marion County, right? It's been around for a long time. Has anybody, I recall from our first session that some folks have participated as growers in the market. Yeah, yeah. So um, farmer's markets are, how many of you have been to the farmer's market? All, we're all familiar with the concept, right? So let's, let's just think about farmer's markets as one of those collaborative opportunities, right? Where we talked about customers are a part of the thing that, that we need to generate in order to, to sell our product. If we individually, if I individually am generating all of those customers, that can be a real time suck. It can be a challenge in terms of marketing, getting the word out. But if there's a farmer's market where there's many growers coming together, perhaps an organization that sponsors the farmer's market can, can help secure that location, right? They can help potentially uh, bring in those customers in a physical location, 
right? They can help potentially um, market your products and the farmer's market itself, right? So this is an opportunity where multiple farms are coming together, again, as individual businesses, but they are coming together in a specific place at a specific time in order to meet their customers and to reduce some of those challenges. So farmer's markets have been on the increase since the 90s when uh, they were starting to be tracked by USDA's Economic Research Service. So in 1994, there were about 1,750 farmer's markets in the US. Uh, that number right now, this might not be 2022's number, but uh, the most recent number I saw was 8,720, and an estimated $1 billion in sales, right? So these farmer's markets are a major outlet for selling food and farm products direct to consumers. Um, but there is some saturation in the market, which we'll talk a little bit more about, yeah. What were some of the major reasons for that growth between 1994 and 2022? What, what reasons do you think that might be? I have no idea, that's why I asked. Does anybody have ideas? Good marketing, right? Good marketing. I mean, people want, you're convinced that food is better if it's local. Yes. Uh, I was gonna say, like an interest in healthy, chemical-free, uh, locally produced food. Has anybody ever heard of the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food campaign? Have you heard that phrase? So that is a phrase that um, really describes this movement uh, of consumers being interested in literally having a face behind the, the produce that they're buying, behind the meat, behind the, the food products that they're buying, and that's been on the increase. Uh, and then many, many organizations nationally, locally, regionally have supported and moved, uh, moved that movement forward. They have um, developed supply chains really that are what we would call shorter supply chains where there's fewer links between the farmer and the customer. And this is kind of one of the lowest barriers to entry to do that. And so it's really been supported by that movement. Yeah. Does anybody else have any thoughts on why that might be? Pressure. It can be, it can be pressure. Um, yeah, it depends, it depends, yeah, it can be. There's been a lot of concerns about recalls as well. Potentially, yeah, yeah potentially. And there's been, a, I mean, there's, so there's a movement, a consumer movement into that space of, of um, interest in food, right? Learning about food, learning about where food comes from. And so part of that's driven here, okay? So farmer's markets can be organized in a number of ways. So farmer's markets could be organized by the producer. It could be a group of farmers coming together and saying, hey, we need an outlet to reach our customers directly. There's this great space in town. It would be very feasible for us to do that and they can organize that. You might also see community organizations or municipalities themselves organizing markets, right? You might see that as um, uh, an organization supporting <coughs> economic development, supporting tourism, for example, supporting health and wellness in their community. There's a lot of reasons that organizations and municipalities might become the, really you could think of it as the host of a farmer's market, right? It might also be local businesses. Again, foot traffic and attracting uh, customers into a specific area could be uh, one of those opportunities. So this weekend, this week, uh, this last week, I went on vacation as a part of my vacation, I went to the farmer's market because why wouldn't I? Um, it was, I went to Boulder, Colorado, um, and I saw that it, Boulder's farmer's market was ranked the number one farmer's market in the United States, so I had to go, right? Um, so, super interesting, lots of vendors, but one thing that I saw was it was, it was located near a community park, and then very close by, within walking distance, was kind of this, this area with a lot of businesses and tourism, restaurants, bookstores, that kind of thing. So you could really see how having hundreds of people at the farmer's market had this spillover effect, right, into the local community, into those businesses, the park, the outdoor space, right? So you could see why the municipality would have an interest in keeping that going and making sure I knew that it was the number one farmer's market in the United States, right? Thomas? Yeah. Um, 
Who sets up the ranking criteria that says it was number one? So that was actually from USA Today. That's where I saw that ranking. Um, I don't know actually what it was based on. It could have been people from Boulder, Colorado themselves saying that it was the best farmer's market in the country. <laughs> And maybe it's a little skewed. But it seemed great. But it was great. Yeah. <laughs> but I but I liked it. So yeah. Questions? Other questions? Comments? Anything? Okay. So thinking about farmers market as a potential opportunity for marketing product, there are opportunities, right, to join an existing market as a producer. As a producer, thinking through whether this is a viable opportunity, you would want to understand who manages that market. You would want to understand the vendor rules. So for example, um, do you have to attend every market? Uh, some farmers markets require that you sell only product that you, you produce. Some markets allow vendors to sell products that they did not produce. There are pros and cons to both of those. But you have to understand the rules of that market. What's the market schedule? Right? Many markets in Ohio start, we're starting to see them start now in May. They might run into September, some even into October. Is it a weekday market or a weekend market? What's the timeline? Right? Are we talking about six to four to six p.m. in the evening? Are we talking about Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m.? You know, what are the actual feasible options for you as a producer to participate in that market? What's the time requirement? Because one of the barriers that we heard, I think Emily, right? Katie. Katie, I'm sorry. But good oh, guess. Yes. There's so, there are so many. Uh, Katie mentioned time as one of the barriers, right? Farmers markets potentially can reduce that time for you to outreach and connect with customers, right? Because they're bringing the customers to the market but they can also require a significant amount of time. So not only do you have to think about the time at the market, you have to think about the time getting prepped and tearing down and getting back from the market. Does anybody who's participated in the market want to share any other insights, thoughts? Okay. Uh, I mean, there are also options in communities that don't have a farmer's market or maybe their farmer's market is um, not thriving to think about whether a new market is a viable opportunity. Again, thinking about all of the parts that I just mentioned, how would it be organized, what's the location and timing, um, what are the risks associated and how do we prepare for those risks? For example, having a lot of customers in a physical location, are we sure that that physical location allows for their mobility? Have we planned for the insurance needs for that? All of those kinds of things. And then also, how do you engage stakeholders and market that to the community? This is an article from NPR a couple of years ago. You can see from the title that uh, there is some question around whether farmers markets, whether the market for farmers markets is saturated, right? So are there so many farmers markets that we're spreading producers too thin and we're spreading customers too thin, right? We're, we're creating a space where they customers can't go into all of these markets, right? So there really are some considerations uh, if that is an opportunity that groups want to consider. Yeah. Um, you can push this question off if it's going to come up later. But okay. so one of um, I guess concerns that I have from past experience in Marion and Morrow County with it being more of a rural area versus an urban is that a lot of people have their own gardens and so forth. So when we're thinking about our marketing in this area, you know, and maybe some of the sellers who have done the local market, like what is the success in this area with pricing and people showing up? Like that's a question that I would have and I feel like it's kind of with that NPR title, but. Mm -hmm. So that question is not something that I can answer right now, right? That's a question that would be based on local information and going out and gathering information about what's here. But it is a question that you that you have to think about in your marketing plan, which we're going to talk about next week. But I think hopefully this conversation will inform that question. And, I, and that I did several farmers markets. Mm -hmm. Marion's was okay. Delaware's was just out of the ballpark. Right. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it brought in everybody from Columbus. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, yeah, like you say, a lot of people marrying raise their own stuff, but it's... Well, I also did CSAs, and that was a CSA pickup point. Right. right, right. So there are opportunities to build on to the market. You see some markets that build in things that are, um, maybe they're community-oriented, maybe they're health and wellness-oriented, right? So maybe a market has um, a healthcare provider, uh, maybe a market has music and entertainment, right? There are lots of ways that markets can try to build that foot traffic, uh, but it's a question of what's feasible for that market. And also, um, you know, there are questions of how many producers come to that market, how many producers can that market support, right? Because the more producers actually, typically, you know, you want a, enough producers that it supports a number of customers, right? So if you have too few producers, that can really kind of be a, um, a detriment based on what your customers want. Yeah, other questions? Um, I think it's also offered a little insight, I don't know which session it was, but sorry, but the, um, he commented that um, part of what we're gonna focus on is diverting the existing spending. And so I don't know what that means yet, but you know, yeah, and that's so, right. And I mean, you all spend a lot of money on produce. I mean, the state spends millions, tens of millions. Um, so a, a couple things. One, in terms of farmers market, our experience in Mansfield is we get a couple of growers who like to go down to Clintonville and like to go to Delaware. They can get a good Saturday out of doing that. That's not their primary income but that's a nice supplemental to the income that they're getting from the, the stuff they're marketing with the cooperative. So it's in the mix. Um, and there are a couple of really good ones within striking distance if you spend a few hours on a Saturday selling produce. The second is that our learning um, curve from Mansfield was we need the buyers in the conversation. And so we've already got buyers in the conversation. We're working back channel behind the scenes right now, um, talking to a couple of restaurants, talking to a couple supermarkets and we're planning a meeting in the next couple of weeks with Yellowbird Food Shed who is very interested in perhaps even purchasing the the crops while you're growing them during the training and so we're going to kind of work that out but the, the not having the buyers in the conversation right now would set you back when you finally get started and that's our goal is to keep that, um, figure out what the landscape is, and ask a lot of the questions that she's asking, and present the kind of opportunity that exists as we get more serious about organizing this next year. I'll, I'll piggyback briefly. This also, this whole effort was sponsored by the Marion Leadership Team, uh, which came out of the Chamber of Commerce yep. and had representation from major industries and employers all around the county. Yep. So yep. there is, there quite there is there's there's a conversation about the potential for Whirlpool to do a box purchasing program for as part of the employee wellness. There's a lot of opportunities, and we're working really hard to make sure we've got a sense of that landscape so that you don't jump into it blind when you start going into operation.
stand for community supported agriculture. It's really a production and marketing model. Uh, started really in the 1980s. I think the first CSA in the US was in like 1986. And it was a model where consumers could pre-purchase shares of the produce that came from a farm, right? So there was an upfront investment from customers that they then, that was used to um, support the operating costs of the farm. And that then entitled those consumers to the output of the farm, typically in a box format over a period of time. Today, when people talk about CSAs, they mean a lot of different things. They don't necessarily just mean that model that I just described with a pre-purchase and produce coming out. A lot of times today when people use that term, they mean a subscription model. They mean where you sign up as a consumer, you pay maybe a set fee per box, or maybe you pay a season long fee, and that entitles you to a box of produce, uh, or a box of meat, or a mixed box perhaps even, uh, in certain intervals over the season, usually. Some allow you to start and stop that subscription, it just depends on what you're looking at. You can kind of think of, um, you guys heard of like HelloFresh, Blue Apron, those? You can kind of think of those as like an extension of the CSA into kind of a large format uh, cooking model, right? So the CSA model can be at a farm level, and when it first started, CSAs were at an individual farm level. But you can also see where there might be potential opportunities for multiple farms to collaborate in a single CSA. So they could work together to market, they could share distribution. So we mentioned there's that whole need to actually get produce in a truck and moved to the place where the end consumers are going to pick it up. And we mentioned the Clintonville Farmers Market is a pickup location, a CSA location. Yeah. So you need actually a way to get produce to those locations. You might need shared people, right? There is physical labor involved in packing, packing the box, getting the box on the truck, getting the box delivered. Uh, there is also labor involved in the ordering and management process. Um, there can be shared, potentially shared e-commerce platforms. We've seen cooperatives come together to create um, what, what, what we would call or what they've called online food hubs, right? So where it's a single e-commerce platform but multiple farmers are listing product on that platform and doing um, distribution in common. So they might distribute to a single location on certain days uh, and it's ordered by customers, right? So, Customers have a cutoff date to order from the online platform. Farmers all get together, pick their list, come over and put it into a box, and then distribute it to a shared drop location. Right, so that shared e-com platform could be an opportunity for collaboration. Peer education and education for the community uh, around local food, around health and wellness, um, all of those aspects are potential opportunities. So, um, there are some folks nationally who have thought about research, looked at the ways that CSAs have changed over time. Um, in particular, Dr. Tim Woods at the University of Kentucky has um, studied this model, written about this model. Some of the potential benefits to multi-farm models are this risk management through diverse crop portfolios. Does anybody wanna take a stab at what that might look like? What, what am I what I'm talking about there? So what would you grow, like, like if some crop fails, at least you have other crops to fall back on? Yes, exactly. So in particular, if you think about multiple farms, not only will you have redundancy in the system, hopefully, where maybe hopefully multiple people are producing some of the same or similar crops. So if one has a failure, hopefully they don't all have a failure. Um, you then also have the opportunity to build in multiple products that way. So for example, if 18 farmers are involved in a multi-farm CSA, perhaps there is the opportunity to offer 180 different products rather than just 10 different products, right? If we all can offer maybe some of these core products and then a couple of different ones, there could be the opportunity for a lot of different products, right? So that allows then for that risk management as well, allowing for the crop failure potential across multiple people. I've 
worked with a co-op that um, had actually that exact scenario where um, they had uh, buyer relationships arranged. They had a couple of different varieties of specialty crop. They had one grower who had a total crop loss, complete failure. What happens if that if that one person is not a part of this, a part of the co-op? What does their buyer potentially say to them? They're probably not coming back, depending on the type of buyer. And in this situation, if they were large wholesale buyers, probably not coming back, right? But in that situation, those other members of the co-op could supplement with their additional growth, and they didn't lose that account, right? So that's what that's talking about. There's also potentially that ability for accessing new markets through the diversity of products, but also through increased volume, right? So putting together the volume that everyone is producing, certain marketplaces need higher volume, right? Certain, for example, restaurants need more volume than others. Grocery stores need more volume, yes. Distribution centers need more. Hospitals need more. Perhaps it's not feasible for an individual to produce that volume, and perhaps it's feasible but too risky, right? Those are also part of that equation. And then you can also look at consistency. So perhaps there's the ability to create that consistency throughout the season, uh, rather than one producer having to do that, um, perhaps being less able to create that stable supply throughout the season. Does that make sense? So challenges for multi-farm CSAs are the potential for additional labor and management, right? When you start getting more product, more volume, more people, you're just adding to the labor. And then also as a producer, there are these questions around whether this is a model that makes sense, right? So is there a willingness to engage with other producers? particularly if their supply or quality doesn't meet the standards that buyers expect. Do you want to be a part of that as a producer? Um, how are you going to make decisions? How are multiple farmers going to make decisions together? How are they going to maintain customer relations? How are they going to build those connections that can be so important for brand awareness and loyalty? And are there going to be sufficient benefits to all of the producers to really make sense? Is there a trend like in farmers markets with the with CSAs? Um, you know, I'd have to look at the data. I would say um, anecdotally, in some ways, yes, we have seen kind of a, a tapering. Right. Um, but I would have to look at the data to be able to say for sure. Yeah. My colleague, again, Christy Welch, um, recently had a um, a program that was all of all it was geared towards growers who were CSA growers. It was an entire conference for CSA growers. It was called Thinking Outside the Box, um, and it's recorded, so I can get a link to that if okay. you guys are interested. Yeah, we'll put that up on the yeah. we'll put that in the folder. Yeah, let me make a note of that. And then there are also great resources uh, from North Carolina State Extension, um, and then there's a guide here for multi farm CSAs. So I'm going to make myself a note. The CSA doesn't the uh, customer share some responsibility for the family? So in that model I was talking about where the customer buys that share up front, yeah. that upfront investment, yes, yeah, you know that there is likely some expectation between the producer and the customer. Hopefully you've set that expectation up front about what that's going to look like, what what actually that share entitles the customer to, but also that there is an amount of risk involved, right? That Farming is risky, and there's the potential that this could it could maybe not turn out this way. In a subscription model, where it's not that share purchase up front, perhaps it's just pay by the box, that might start looking a little different. So it is important to have clear communication with customers about what they're getting and what they can expect. Does that make sense? Yeah. So Kip mentioned Whirlpool as an example. Are most CSAs uh, secured through businesses for employees, or is it more individual? It depends. So there like is how a, is it marketed? Yeah, there is a mix. There are some CSAs that are marketed towards individuals, individual households. There are some that partner with uh, corporate uh, entities to do like employee wellness programs. 
Um, I don't I don't have the data on how that's split out, but it but it's a vote. Yeah. Other questions? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Is there uh, a mail order CSA? Or is this basically face to face? Oh, um, so are there CSAs where you can just get a box dropped at your house, delivered to your house? Um, many of the CSAs that I have seen that are local food based, right, that they're regional production, have some type of drop location where the customer picks up. Home delivery starts getting into like a whole lot of other logistical components, but I mean, I'm sure there are some more established, developed CSAs that offer home delivery. Um, I would say that what I've seen, and feel free to share your experience, is that that's less typical in a local and regional food system context. So you might see it, for example, in these national brands that sort of like butcher box. That's like a national brand subscription model home delivery, but at like the local regional level. I've not seen a ton of home delivery. Green bean might be the one. Has anybody heard of green bean? So that's like an online marketplace box box style that has home delivery. I don't know how much of that home delivery is still happening. Yeah. There's also one from um called Misfit, like the Misfit, Misfit Market. Yeah, Misfit Market. And I'll just add Yellowbird is that type of market. So Yellowbird Food Shed, who we may ultimately do business with, is sort of like, it's a direct marketing, you order it on the site, it's all Ohio produce, and they deliver the box to your door. They do this, the kind of CSA thing where you order the box, you pay $35, and what's harvested is what's in there, but they also have a crop by crop selection, and so you can do a custom box as well. So they're kind of a hybrid yeah. re <coughs> retail model. Yeah. Yeah, so what you're seeing is like these kind of what you would consider like an online farmer's market, right, where you can select yeah. actual items kind of mixed with this subscription box yeah. model. CSAs have gone through a lot of change. Right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Partly because of some of the struggles of those early CSAs, yeah. right? Where customers got a box and they got what they got, right? How many of us like to get what we get? Right. I did one of those in Florida and I realized I can only cook uh, collard so many different ways. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And when the box shows up and you're like, what is, what is that? Right? There's a lot of larger quantities of product from nursery crops to uh, fruits and vegetables, plants, that kind of thing. Uh, and they have a set uh, schedule through their peak season. Usually, again, produce auctions are just starting here in Ohio and they'll go through the fall. And the auction schedule will be produced by the organizer of the auction. And there, there will be public auctions where buyers, whether they are restaurant owners or grocery stores or retail vendors, other buyers, individuals perhaps, can come buy lots of, um, excuse me, whatever is on sale. Typically, we're talking about larger volume lots. So Ohio has an estimated uh, 12 produce auctions. Um, when I was looking at the map today, actually Marion County has a produce auction the east and the west, if they're both still active. I know the one in Morrow County is what you said. Yeah. Resale in some instances, right? They could be 
um, small grocery stores, it could be restaurants. In some instances, you can even see large retailers or wholesalers coming to purchase in those large quantities. Right? Again, there's some, typically some organization, some group of people coming together in order to organize that auction, right? There's somebody who's putting together the rules of the auction, securing the space, organizing the time, making sure there's an auctioneer, making sure there's an order buyer, right? All of that logistical piece. Uh, so there's typically some, you know, it could be a, a loose coalition of producers. It could be uh, a nonprofit. There's one in Southeast Ohio that's run by a nonprofit organization. And uh, you can find more and you can see the map actually of the, it's probably a little dated at this point, but you can see that map uh, at this point. Yeah. Um, expectation about selling in that kind of a market, is that basically commercial wholesale level? Typically you are gonna have to meet wholesale expectations, right? So you're gonna have to meet uh, packaging expectations, uh, bin expectations, whether they're using C codes potentially, uh, it depends on the marketplace. But yeah, grades, you're going to need to meet those wholesale expectations, at least in some of those marketplaces. Yeah, and I probably would not expect retail pricing. No, no, no. Auction pricing is not retail pricing. The auctions, don't they do sell uh, retail? They, they have an area that they sell ones, and then they go all the way up to the top of the quantity. Yeah. As well. And that's where a lot of the, the farmers markets go to get vendors they buy there as well. Yeah. So you might see, for example, farmers markets that um, allow for resale. They might go to produce auctions to get these ones uh, that they can then bring back to the farmers market. Some, like you said, yeah, they do have a retail space uh, and then all the way up to wholesale. So they might be there for an inventory buy. Could be. And out Creek, you can actually go online and look what they're selling and the prices they're going for. Yeah. And you can, I mean, there are auctions as well where you just have a direct line to the order buyer, call the order buyer, tell the order buyer what you want, and then uh, the order buyer then is in charge of getting that for you from the auction. So there are sales that happen that way, direct. And this is also a large space, so somebody mentioned, this is a large, um, Many of these auctions have a large um, contingent of the Plain community here in Ohio. Yeah. So Amish and Mennonites and other Plain communities participate. And in, in Mansfield, we did utilize the produce auction a couple different times when we had an excessive surplus and we didn't have buyers. So it was kind of our market of last resort before you were giving away the food. Um, and so we were happy to get something for some of those vegetables. But it's not the regular place to go on the scale that you're growing at for the price point that you want. Other comments, questions? Okay. So what I'd like to do is take five minutes, get up and stretch, and then we can come back and dive into the cooperative. So let's take five. <laughs> So, what I want to shift to now is thinking about the cooperative business model specifically, right? So, less about, um, you know, farmers markets, CSA, produce auctions are um, models in collective marketing that can be organized a number of ways, right? I mentioned they could be organized by producer groups, they could be organized by municipalities. When we're thinking about the cooperative business model, really we're thinking about a structure, a business structure for creating a, an enterprise that brings people together. So my first ask is that you share with me some words that you associate with cooperative. You can also feel free to say, I've never thought about cooperatives before this minute. Um, but if you've heard the term co-op, if you've heard the term cooperative, what are some things that come to mind? A group of people with one object, you know, headed in one direction. Okay, yeah, a group of people headed in one direction, right, with a shared objective. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. What else? Working together. Working together, absolutely. Instead of competing against each other for the same purpose. Yeah, instead of 
yeah, so moving from this competitive model into a model of, of cooperative uh, opportunity. Yeah. Cost sharing. Cost sharing. Yeah. Absolutely. What else? Those are some pretty good ones. So all of those feed into really what a co-op is. So I'm going to talk about cooperatives as a business model. A cooperative can be, this is from a, um, a colleague who's a cooperative attorney, described cooperatives this way once to me, and I thought, that's, that's it, that makes sense. Because oftentimes when people are talking about co-ops or cooperatives, they mean different things, right? So some people, they, they might have a different understanding. And I think part of that comes from the, the fact that a cooperative, when we're talking about it, it can be a legal entity, right? Like an LLC, like a corporation. In some states, it is its own uh, legal structure, legal entity, excuse me. It can also be a legal structure. It can be um, a cooperatively operated LLC corporation, other format of legal entity. It's also a tax category. In certain instances, cooperatives have a particular subchapter in the Internal Revenue Code for their tax category. Right? Organizations that meet those uh, definitions under subchapter T of the Internal Revenue Code are taxed as cooperatives. It can also be, and is I think in every situation uh, where there's a cooperative, a set of practices, values, and principles. There's this shared globally recognized set of principles that cooperatives operate by that we're gonna talk about in some detail. Does that make sense? Question? Um, yeah. There's a lot of expressions of the free enterprise system out there. Um, mm -hmm. you know, C Corp, S Corps, LLC are the most popular ones, but is that the same kind of an expression here in terms of a co-op or a 501c3 or you know, all, all these different kinds of expressions of, of free enterprise? So really what you're talking about are ways of organizing legal structures of organizing business. Right, organizing uh, market opportunities, free enterprise. This is another one of those. And actually, I'll show you in a couple of slides um, a chart that compares cooperatives to those others that you just mentioned. They have similarities, but they also have distinctions um, that I hope we can kind of start to introduce. And if you have more questions, let me know. Questions? two definitions here of cooperative. Um, I like both, but the second one is easier to remember. The first one is from the International Cooperative Alliance. That's a global organization that brings together cooperatives of all different kinds. And so they're defining cooperatives as autonomous associations of persons united voluntarily to meet their common economic, social, and cultural needs and aspirations a jointly owned and democratically controlled enterprise. You're going to see pieces of these words later. This, is, this definition incorporates many of the cooperative principles. I would argue that the, the thing to concentrate on in this definition is joint ownership and democratic control. Okay, so what we're talking about is a joint ownership model. And as Dave, was it Dave too? Yes. Yeah. As Dave too mentioned, um, there are many ways of organizing business. Some of them also involve joint ownership. In fact, a lot of them involve joint ownership. The thing that distinguishes cooperatives is this democratic control. Okay? That's, a, that's a key factor in co-op. And then these other pieces fill in to bring these other principles into the model. This second one is a little easier, like I said, to see. It's a form of business that's owned and controlled by the people who use its services, so it benefits its users. So user ownership, user control, user benefit. If we were to have a test after this, those three things would be on. User ownership, user control, user benefit. Okay? So there are lots of examples of cooperatives out in, in the wild, right? There are cooperatives in urban communities, rural communities, suburban communities, that are doing all kinds of different things. So has anybody heard of Ace Hardware? Yeah, okay. Ace Hardware is actually a cooperative. So those independent stores that are locally owned, 
join together in a wholesale purchasing cooperative to bring in the supplies that they're selling and to market on behalf of all of those local independent stores. Has anybody seen um, IGA stores? Do you have IGA here? No. Not, not anymore? That's unfortunately. Yeah. We still have an IGA in my community. Um, that is a wholesale purchasing cooperative of grocers, of independent grocers. Right? They're coming together to purchase in bulk the goods that they then sell. In some instances, purchasing cooperatives come together to bulk purchase the goods that they utilize. Right? Um, has anybody heard of Do It Best? You probably have a Do It Best lumber yard somewhere close. We have one in my community. Also, a wholesale purchasing cooperative, right? That's a lumber purchasing cooperative. Those independent uh, lumber yards come together to purchase in bulk, right? To realize economies of scale that they couldn't realize as an independent retailer. So, purchasing cooperatives are a big component of the cooperative community. This it represents a, a rural electric cooperative. So, there are rural electric cooperatives powering the United States uh, across about. Uh, somewhere between 48 and 52 percent of U.S. land mass, right? So a big portion of our communities are powered by close to 900 electric distribution cooperatives across the country. So this really is a story about rural communities, particularly not having access to electricity during the Great Depression, and those communities coming together with the help of federal funds to create rural electric cooperatives that electrify those communities using a nonprofit model because investor owned firms uh, were not, hi, welcome, uh, were not um, investing in those communities because it was not as profitable, right? There was not the profit per mile that made it feasible to put the infrastructure in those communities. So, rural electric cooperatives are still a <coughs> component of the cooperative community. This one represents producer cooperatives. So producer marketing cooperatives are an important part of the agricultural supply chain. We'll talk more about them kind of broadly, but you see producer cooperatives, particularly ag producer cooperatives, marketing everything from dairy to dry beans, <clears throat> excuse me, to grains, to specialty crops, really all across the spectrum. We'll talk more about that. You can also see producer cooperatives with other types of producers, right? So um, artist cooperatives, for example, are a form of a producer coming together to jointly market their product. So artists coming together, perhaps uh, leasing a space in common, marketing that space as a shared gallery, uh, putting their art in that gallery to attract customers, not unlike a farmer's market, right? So that's a form of a producer marketing cooperative. <coughs> are a big component of uh, the cooperative community. They're considered um, uh, a part of the cooperative community because they are uh, owned and controlled by their depositors, right? The people who utilize the, the credit union are the folks who own it. They're the shareholders uh, and they control it. Uh, this one represents worker cooperatives. So uh, there's a growing community of cooperatives that are jointly owned and democratically controlled by the people who work the enterprise. So they contribute their labor. So there are places like restaurants, uh, Casa Nueva in Athens. Has anybody been to Athens? Yeah? Have you been to Casa Nueva, hopefully? Yes. So Casa Nueva is a worker-owned restaurant, cantina, in Athens. It's owned by the uh, employees who provide their labor to the co-op. They do that in a, de a democratic structure. It's actually pretty fascinating. Um, there are examples of manufacturing facilities, retailers, uh, home, home health care, all different kinds of sectors being organized in the worker co-op space. And then um, this, this one represents really food co-ops, but also I use it to represent multi-stakeholder cooperatives, where perhaps there's a group of people so you've seen, for example, producers coming together, workers coming together, consumers coming together, businesses coming together, right? The members of a cooperative can be many different sectors. In a multi-stakeholder cooperative, you see, you see multiple groups coming together. So you might see 
consumers and producers. So for example, there's a food co-op here in Ohio, there's actually multiple food co-ops here in Ohio that have producer members that supply the food co-op and consumer members who purchase from the food co-op, right? So they're bringing together multiple groups of people in that membership. Does that make sense? Does anybody have other examples of cooperatives that they wanna share? REI. <laughs> yeah. Um, Member since 92. Nice. <laughs> nice. REI has been a co op since 1938. Um, uh, Land O'Lakes, the Butter folks, Ocean Spray, the Cranberry yes. folks, Welch's, the Great People, uh, Blue Diamond, the Nut People. <laughs> um, those are actually all farmer owned co ops. The Associated Press started out as a cooperative. And one that I think is like kind of the most interesting, maybe not, I think about a lot of co-ops. The Green Bay Packers what? are organized as a community cooperative. Wow. Yes. They're the only NFL team that's, or, that's owned by their community. So it's like when you get a, a different car and you start seeing like all the cars that are the same as your car, right? You'll start, hopefully you'll start seeing co-ops out in the wild where you're like, oh, I didn't even know that that was a cooperative. So there are all of these forms of cooperative ownership that we just talked about. I just wanted to put them here so you can see them. Producers, consumers, purchasing or service-based co-ops. Some, some are operating in social or public services, for example. Those home health care. Um, housing cooperatives are one that I didn't mention. Community coming together to own their, their space where they live. Uh, worker cooperatives and multi-stakeholder questions. I'm sorry, I don't understand the difference between a co-op and like an ESOP or okay. a gain sharing or, you know. If I have not clarified that after the chart that compares business structures, okay. ask me again. It's coming, okay. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. It's, I'm glad that you're thinking that way because um, sometimes it is a little hard to, to see the difference. So there are about 64,000 co-ops, and this is from some colleagues at the University of Wisconsin Center for Co-ops. Uh, because I described earlier that co-ops can be all these things, it's kind of hard to count them. So uh, getting data on cooperatives is a little trickier in an academic setting than getting data on, for example, sole proprietorships or LLCs. So there's about 64,000 co-ops nationally, with about 852,000 employees as of 2019. Here in Ohio, our team did a project uh, in 2020, 2021, that counted about 452 co-ops headquartered in the state with about 1,088 physical locations for cooperatives. And we have organized that by sector. So we have an interactive map here where you can go up, say, I want to see you know, orange dots or credit unions. You can say, I just want to see credit unions, or I don't want to see credit unions. And you can uh, take a look at that. So there are co-op locations in 85 with our 88 counties here in Ohio. So let's think about cooperative principles. And I would say, Dave, that one of the things that distinguishes co-ops is their adherence to these principles from some of those other business structures. But we'll get into the more nitty-gritty as well of what those actual business structure differences are. So cooperatives operate, like I said, by this set of locally recognized principles that's actually put forward by the um, International Cooperative Alliance. So it's that apex organization of cooperatives across the globe. The last time they came together and promulgated these principles was in 1995. So this is the, the most recent version. This version actually traces its roots back to the 1840s to a consumer cooperative um, really a worker cooperative too, um, in England um, that was developed by um, a group of workers in a factory who came together to purchase goods. So things like flour, candles, butter, um, to produce, to purchase goods that, that they could be assured were high quality at a fair price, right? So these principles date back to that. The first being voluntary and open membership. Right, cooperatives, as I mentioned, are associations where people come together of their own choice. Right, so you're not gonna go 
start a farm in Marion County, Ohio, and somebody say you have to be a member of this co-op, right? It's voluntary to join. Open membership refers to the fact that cooperatives are non-discriminatory based on uh, things like race and gender and religion. So that group that I went in full membership allowed women to vote, um, allowed people of different religions, pretty progressive for that time, right? So it, the idea here is that, that that membership is open to all who can use the membership. Now, what this does not mean is that, for example, um, a farm who produces only produce can go out and become a member of a dairy marketing cooperative because they have no use for the dairy marketing cooperative, right? They don't produce dairy products. So open membership to those who can utilize the services. It also doesn't necessarily mean that membership in a cooperative is open all of the time, right? So some cooperatives that market products, really what the, what the cooperative is doing is marketing products on behalf of its members. So think about how that could be a tricky job in terms of matching the market with the product, right? That's the cooperative's function. So there are instances where cooperatives uh, have a closed membership or they might have a closed membership for a period of time because they're trying to do that matching between the buyer, between the marketplace and the product. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so just to clarify, so um, everybody in here but me are part of the co-op from the micro farm. Sure. And I want to get in. Is everybody voting? Is that what the member control means? Potentially. I haven't gone through the training or like I'm not sure. part of it, so I'm on the outside. Yeah, whatever the requirements are, the co-op puts together at the beginning. So membership membership requirements are these, right? Um, it can be, so for example, in, worker, in some worker cooperatives, the entire membership might vote to accept a new member who has met those requirements, done training, gone through a probationary period. In some instances, it can be the board who accepts new members. Right? There can be a policy where the board, the board reviews membership uh, requests or applications on a certain uh, regular period and accepts those as a board. And we'll talk more about the role of the board as we go along. Does that make sense? Yeah. Democratic member control refers to the fact that cooperatives operate in a way that ensures uh, control of across the entire membership using a democratic structure. Usually that's what we call a one member, one vote system. So regardless of uh, capital invested, regardless of the amount of business done with the cooperative, each member gets one vote. So Dave, this is quite different from some of those other structures that you were just mentioning, right? The one member, one vote system um, ensures that there is control across the membership rather than in um, one small group of, of members. Capital and control are not the same thing in a cooperative. Does that make sense? It'll make sense the more you hear it. I think it too, if it doesn't right now. Okay. Some co-ops use, I said generally, you'll hear me, a lot of qualifiers. <laughs> Uh, some co-ops don't use a one member, one vote system. They might be at a scale where that's not feasible, so they'll use some other um, system that ensures that democratic control. Okay. Member economic participation refers to the fact that the users of the cooperative, those member owners of the cooperative, are um, actually the folks who provide the capital for the cooperative as well. So members of a cooperative are the owners of the cooperative. If you all are going to potentially go out and start your own business, right? And as an entrepreneur, you'll be expected to contribute capital to that enterprise, right? If I go out and start a coffee shop, if Sam and I are like, co-ops are not our thing anymore, we're gonna go start a coffee shop, um, it's likely that both Sam and I will contribute some form of capital, right? Probably cash, maybe cash and labor, maybe some mix, right? Um, but we will be expected to make that economic contribution. That's true of members of the co-op as well. Members of the co-op are expected to make a financial contribution to the enterprise because they are the owners of the enterprise. 
This also means that the members are um, participating in the business of the enterprise. So those marketing cooperatives I mentioned, right? The, the, um, the ones that put shelf products in the grocery store, right? The Welch's, the Blue Diamonds, the Dairy, um, Ocean Spray, all of those, they work because the members set market their product through the cooperative, right? So the members do business with the co-op. That's another form of economic participation. As owners, those members are also entitled to the benefits of the cooperative. And what's one of the benefits of owning a business? Profit. <laughs> Hopefully profit. <laughs> um, so members also in a cooperative are uh, generally, again, qualifier, entitled to share in the profits of the enterprise. In a cooperative, that uh, sharing in the profits of the enterprise, you might hear some co-op folks call that surplus rather than profit. Uh, we'll talk about that more on Thursday. Um, they, you part, Members of a cooperative participate in that sharing based on their use of the cooperative. That's a really big distinction in cooperatives. You participate in that profit or surplus sharing based on use, not based on investment. Again, decoupling the capital investment from the profit sharing. Can you give an example of that with, in relation to what we're doing? Sure. So um, perhaps when, when uh, a group of producers comes together, uh, maybe everybody has to buy into the cooperative at a certain price. Let's put it at $100, right? But when you sell product to the cooperative, perhaps it's, it's unlikely that the entire group is going to do that in the same way, right? So maybe you're supplying more product to the cooperative than I am. When there is surplus at the end of the fiscal year, the cooperative is going to um, distribute that surplus to members. They're going to save some of it to the, into the cooperative. But what they distribute to members, they're actually going to distribute more to you than to me because you did more business with the co-op than I did. But we both had the same level of investment. If there were opportunities to invest additionally, right? perhaps there are opportunities for me to invest more. So maybe I have more capital in the co-op, but you have more product. You will still receive a larger portion, generally, you will still receive a larger portion of that surplus allocation than I would, even though my investment might be greater. Does that make sense? So it keeps it labor based and not somebody who can come in and basically buy out. It's based it. on use of the co op. Yeah. Whatever the use of the co op is defined as, that's what it's based on. So is that, is that called revenue contribution percentages you know, among the members? Um, no, not really. So there will be members will have equity in the enterprise um, and they will, there are different ways that they can contribute that equity. But, but they're sharing in a surplus based on their use of the business, either in terms of volume or value. Okay. okay. I think it'll become clearer again on Thursday. Questions? More questions? Okay. Autonomy and independence refers to the fact that cooperatives are, remember that first definition, autonomous associations. They're governed by uh, and on behalf of the membership. So cooperatives actually are governed by a board of directors that are elected from and by the members of the cooperative. That's also different than other business models, okay? And if cooperatives are out in the world doing business with other organizations, with other businesses, perhaps in joint ventures with other businesses, the cooperative retains its autonomy. Those members retain their autonomy and control over the enterprise. That board of directors remains in control of the cooperative. Does that make sense? Okay. Education, training, and information is principle five. Sometimes people in the co-op will, will um, abbreviate these P5. So education, training, and information. This refers to the fact that uh, cooperatives have a duty and a responsibility to educate their members on the cooperative model, how this cooperative works, how things are going at this cooperative, because it takes an informed membership and an informed board of directors to make the, the cooperative function. It also, I would argue, refers to the fact that cooperatives as, um, really as entities that bring in multiple units, 
right? They're they're creating this this kind of structure where multiple business units, likely or maybe multiple household units, are coming together. They do the cooperative does better when the units are doing better. So think about a dairy marketing cooperative. What happens if the individual members of that cooperative are not producing high quality dairy product? What happens if the individual members of that cooperative aren't producing enough product, right? So the cooperative has an interest in helping its members produce high quality product at volume, typically. Does that make sense? Concern, oh, cooperation among cooperatives. P6 is really just referring to this idea that cooperatives are, are a global movement. They're often a network. So you'll see, for example, uh, rural electric cooperatives, for example, have often state organizations and national organizations that do things like shared purchasing or advocacy on their behalf or education and training, right? The idea is that uh, these networks of cooperatives strengthen the individual cooperative. P7 is concern for community. Really this, this idea, I think of this idea as the idea that cooperatives are, are in some ways locally owned. They're community owned. They're owned by the people who benefit from them. The community might look different depending on the co-op. So as I said earlier, if you've seen one co-op, you've seen one co-op, right? So that community is defined differently based on the cooperative, but it's owned by those people. So that community could be farmers in one county. It could be local independent hardware store owners across the United States, right? But the concern is for that community. Does that make sense? So as we talk more about cooperatives, I think you will see these principles uh, impact how co-ops do business. So let's talk about this question of, okay, all right, let's take the structure of a cooperative and compare to these other common structures, common ways of organizing business, right? So these are very common kind of characteristics of uh, business ownership and control. So we're thinking about ownership, we're thinking about purpose, we're thinking about membership requirements. My next slide, we'll think about financing, we'll think about control in both voting and management, right? So you can see co-ops all the way here on your right, and then other very common forms of business enterprise. Nonprofit corporations, traditional corporations, what sometimes are called C corporations or S even S corporations would fall under this. Limited liability companies, partnerships, many types, so we're gonna talk about generic partnerships, sole proprietorships, right, compared to cooperatives. So I mentioned that cooperatives are member owned. So the people, the, the owners, the actual owners of the enterprise in a cooperative are user members. They can be individuals, so people, like me standing here, or they can be entities. So for example, if my farm is organized as an LLC, then that LLC might become a member of a cooperative. Does that make sense? In other enterprises, sole proprietorships are owned by a single individual. Partnerships are owned by two or more individuals. LLCs can be owned by one or more individuals. Shareholders in a corporation, there can be one, there can be thousands. There can be hundreds of thousands, right? They are owners by virtue of their share purchase. Nonprofit, nonprofit corporations actually don't have legal owners. Okay? When we think about the purpose of a cooperative, the purpose is to meet the member's need, whatever that need is. So in a marketing cooperative, it's generally to find a home for the product that the members are producing. Right? So to find a market, a viable market, a market that's going to return more and create viable opportunities for the members of that cooperative. It is also, in some instances, to, re to create a return on member investment, but that is not the primary purpose of a cooperative. In some instances, there is a, what's called a profit maximization imperative in a corporate structure. Right, so the corporation has to maximize returns to shareholders, not so in the cooperative model. 
and the purpose is to meet members' needs. Does that make sense? In a nonprofit, the idea is to provide services or information, typically for some type of community benefit or some type of benefit to its users. What's the business purpose of a sole proprietorship or a partnership or an LLC? Earn a livelihood, maybe? Create jobs in the community, perhaps. Create a return on investment. All of those are certainly valid purposes. Membership requirements, you can see here. To become a member of a co-op, there's generally some type of, remember I mentioned that, capital requirement. Um, and there's some type of membership eligibility that's established by the cooperative. Um, in some cases, nonprofits have members. There may be a fee. In corporate corporations, it's a stock purchase. Remember I mentioned shareholders by virtue of their stock purchase. And then all the remainder are determined by the owners. We call them different things. They could be an owner or partner member. Does that make sense? It's a, it's a lot of information. So when we're thinking about financing, uh, we are thinking about in a cooperative that, that member's capital contribution there's typically an upfront capital contribution and then capital contributed over time. Remember I mentioned that members share in the surplus or the profit. Part of that surplus can be retained by the cooperative and reinvested, but it is a part of the equity of the individual member. So it's allocated to the member, it belongs to the member, but it's additional investment in the cooperative by that member. Just like in a sole proprietorship or a partnership or an LLC, for example, where there's retained profit in the enterprise. Corporations retain profit. Cooperatives do that as well. Yeah. Corporations can borrow money, correct? Correct. I got a, a little cooperative, I think. Both. Right. Yep. Yep. And also, you haven't used the term patronage dividend. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> I thought that was up for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Not yet. So patronage dividend refers to the way, sorry, I said that members share in the profit or the surplus based on use. Patronage, right? The amount that you use the business, your patronage, entitles a member to a dividend, right? A patronage dividend based on their, their payment is called a patronage dividend, typically. Some co-ops might call it a different thing. Yeah. Um, okay, so does the Financing part makes sense. Cooperative. So these are these are all um, cooperatives are separate entities if they are organized as such. They're separate entities, separate from their members. So they can take on debt. They can sue. They can be sued. Those types of things. Same same as like a corporation, a nonprofit, an LLC. Okay. Voting, as I mentioned, is one member, one vote typically in a cooperative. There are other ways of doing that democratically. It's often a one member, one vote. In a corporation, uh, shareholders vote their shares, right? So shareholders vote the number of shares that they own in the enterprise. So that correlates with their investment. So you're in a, in a traditional corporation, you purchase shares, that's your investment in the enterprise, and then you vote those shares. So your control in the enterprise is directly tied to your investment in the enterprise. Remember I said, in a co-op, that it's decoupled, right? So that investment and control are not the same thing. One number, one vote, regardless of that the contribution, okay? That's a major distinction. In other structures, uh, voting is, is according, <coughs> according to how it's set up. It's often in proportion to investment, it does not have to be, okay? And then management and governance, I mentioned cooperatives are governed by a board of directors who are elected from and by the membership. So the directors are themselves members. In other structures, that's not necessarily the case, right? The, the shareholders or the board of directors in a traditional corporation don't necessarily have to be shareholders. Same thing with a nonprofit. They don't necessarily have to be members. In a cooperative, those directors are themselves members. It is possible for cooperatives to have non-member directors 
in certain instances in certain places, like in Ohio, that's um, allowed, but they are uh, limited in their number. So they can't be like the entire board of directors. Usually that's a situation where like outside expertise or specific expertise would be valuable. Okay, that's a lot of information. Question. Okay, you might be able to tell that it's like one of my favorite parts because of the legal aspect. But <laughs> Sorry, I guess I'm fixing myself here. So the, the standards of the performance of the board of directors is determined by the members. Generally, yes. In a corporation, the standards of performance for the board of directors is the stockholders. Yes. We can talk more after if you'd like. Sorry, I, I think I just... Okay. I, I just
So ag cooperatives across the United States um, are operating uh, about, about 1,800 ag co-ops in the United States. Uh, by primary function, a little over half are doing marketing. Just under, just over 40% are doing purchasing. Fewer are doing service. Again, by primary function, some some cooperatives are doing all three. But academics like to put them in a box. Okay. So um, these these almost 1,800 co-ops are doing pretty large business volume, right? Just over 200 billion dollars in gross business volume in 2019, and this is the data for 2019. <coughs> Many of them are, um, have been doing business for some time, right? They're, uh, they've been around doing this business for more than 100 years. There's almost 2 million voting members in cooperatives. Those of you who keep up with the statistics on uh, farmers in the United States will see that that's actually pretty close to the number of active farmers in the United States. Um, that counts uh, multiple memberships. So one farmer can have memberships in many cooperatives. They're getting counted multiple times here. But that is still a pretty large portion of uh, the current agricultural ecosystem. There's close to 100, 140,000 full-time employees at these cooperatives. What are they doing? They're marketing products. So you can see here, this is not in rank order. I should have done that. Um, grains and oil seed marketing are the largest segment of cooperative marketing in agriculture. But then we also see dairy. Some of the um, last statistics I saw were that dairy marketing cooperatives were marketing somewhere around, don't quote me on this, somewhere around 40% of the dairy in the United States. Okay, so they're a large segment of the supply chain. But you can see all different kinds of commodities here. The cotton, cotton peas, fruits and veg, livestock. And then also cooperatives are uh, pretty active in the supply of inputs to farmers across the United States. So selling, purchasing in bulk or sometimes manufacturing even and then distributing across their ecosystem. Things like fertilizer, seeds, crop protectants, Petroleum products, right, fuel. These are um, the supplies in gross business, gross sales for 2019. So, with that, I think I want to save the slide for thinking about the startup development of a new cooperative for next time. But I want to stop here and see if there are questions points for discussion, things that surprise you, things that you're still confused about that you want me to talk about on Thursday. I would just want to add, because we are overwhelming you with information, yes. um, and that's part of our goal. You're not going to retain it all. But built into this fall will be an opportunity to sit in on a Richland Grow Up board meeting and to have an opportunity to talk with the members there about the questions that start to arise for you. So, so there'll, be, there'll be continued opportunity for this, but this is, from, from the perspective of the microfarm project, this is one of the hearts of the system. Your own microfarms is, is a heart of the system. But you know we've glommed onto the cooperative model, and this approach to how you think about what you're growing and how you get your stuff um, marketed is is so far working out pretty well in uh, in Mansfield. So it's good to know, and it's really important to understand. I, I mean, I didn't know this till I saw Hannah's first workshop about five years ago. How ubiquitous this practice was. So there's lots and lots and lots of models out there to look at and to think about. Most of the mass communications and all those kinds of things about business has been to maximize profit. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not seeing that here. Um, now it's on the list, mm -hmm. you know, but I think it's number two or number three. Mm -hmm. um, my, is my take correct here? I mean, because what I'm hearing is that 
working in a cooperative at the top of the list is for the greater good. It's for the benefit of the members. Yeah, the idea is to provide the benefit to the members. And so that benefit is typically whatever service the cooperative provides. So it's access to market, it's um, access to certain services, it's the ability to sell product with fewer costs, for example. So the benefit is typically tied to that service. Now, Patronage dividends, ability to share in the profits and the surplus are certainly a benefit, for sure. Um, but in general, the idea is that the thing that the cooperative prioritizes is the functions it provides to members for their benefit. I guess that's why I go with the greater good, because really the co-op helps manage risk. It can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my take is that that is the number one reason why people lose their business, is because they don't manage risk correctly. So there are some indications, I mean, there are some data that suggests that cooperatives are, um, that they are longer lasting than other forms of business, right? So the statistics are that something like 80% of small businesses fail within their first two to five years, right? Um, in the cooperative, the indication is that the success rate is much higher than that. I have a colleague who says that that's because cooperatives are so hard to get started in the first place, <laughs> right? Because it's the, the death happens before it ever gets started. I'd like to, somebody can research that. <laughs> yeah, my hypothesis though would be that it's that risk mitigation, it's the, the collective work and each, so the cooperative is the aggregation of each of your own individual businesses. And on your business, your LLC small farm, you're trying to maximize your profits. And so that gets built into the DNA of, well, what's in the member's interest here, right? And so it's not, it's not absent the profit motive, but it diffuses it in what I think is a highly productive way. It decentralizes it and then recentralizes it in a way that, that can bring, I would, uh, lack of a better word, more joy for the participant than perhaps being a, sh a stockholder of a company. You know, it's not just dividends, but there are intangibles as well. It depends on the cooperative. Mm -hmm. I mean, Send a letter to the board of directors. And all of this DNA is what you guys will build into. We've got some, we've got some models and some other things, but ultimately it's up to you to decide what those parameters are, thinking about the success and longevity of, you know, of the business itself. 
Um, there's also, you know, members sign, so this is what we're doing in, in with the Richland Grub, members sign an agreement to, and we'll talk about crop plans in a few weeks, but to produce according to the crop plan. They've set up a, if you're growing in the crop plan, the cooperative takes 25%, the farmer gets 75%, but they're also willing to take any surplus crop, which they do at a 60-40 split on commission. Um, and so, but there's a whole lot of ways to slice that up. And, you know, it's, you guys own it. So it's ultimately, well, what do we think is the best way to do this for our success and for the, for the cooperative success? Something like that. I'm a gifted teacher. Oh, yeah. yeah. Is it more? It depends. It actually depends on your um, IQ. IQ. There yeah. we go. Yep. So we're going to say at least seven, maybe more. Um, so feel free to ask questions. I'll be back on Thursday and we'll get forward to dive deeper. Hey, let's have a hand for Hannah. Thank you so much, Hannah. I really appreciate it. And we'll